Well, the ad veracundium fallacy, the argumentum ad veracundium. Um, well, well, the important thing here, see, so, so we saw that there, there can be legitimate and, and even strong deductive arguments based on authority if the person is genuinely an authority, right? If your doctor tells you you need to lose some weight or you need to get your blood pressure down, it, it, that's probably a good authority to, you know, to support that conclusion. Um, so, so the key in, in, in the ad veracunium fallacy is um, that this is an appeal to an unsuitable authority, to an authority that really isn't an authority. So, um, you know, and, and sometimes uh, this is, I mean, you see a lot, right, in commercials where someone endorses a product and, and they don't necessarily have to be um, you know experts or knowledgeable in that area but we we form a positive association right um, you know for years tire was promoted viewing um, but you know basically they want to me when I was, I was up in the office today, um, one good way of seeing that we're basically being asked to make a decision on, on emotional grounds. Um, now we could play some of Tiger's commercials. Uh, Let's see if we get a good one on Buick. I mean, the problem with trying to find a Tiger Woods commercial that you want to play is he's got so many of them. Um,
Johnny's movies of all time, golfer, otherwise, Caddyshack. Um, well, all right, but Tiger pushes Buick, but the, the, what I wanted you to look at, though, and, and, and this gives you a, a good idea of, well, okay, here's, here, here's a good one from YouTube. Okay, so we don't have, uh, how come I don't have audio? What? Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, uh, that's what I'm. I'm trying to get the X. So we make a uh, a positive association, but I mean, one good way to see that it's mostly based on emotional reasons. Think about it this way: if Tiger really were an authority on automobiles, and he was giving you good logical reasons why you ought to have a Buick. Um, would that have changed with his um, his problems uh, with his uh, marriage and stuff? And he'd say, well, no. Um, and okay. It's like all this stuff pulled up when I was in the office. Um, well, Okay, the, the point I wanted to make, let's, let's try, let's take out the word commercial, and I think it'll bring it up. Now, here we have an article that lets you know it's, it's about positive emotional association. And, and, and we're not picking on Tiger here, right? We're, we're um, uh, you know, this illustrates. In other words, Buick and Tiger part ways after nine years. Why? Because of all the marital troubles, right? And and the fact that people might now have a negative association. And so, uh, and, and note, if he were giving you good, solid, logical reasons why you want to buy a Buick that held together logically, it wouldn't matter about his marital troubles. They would be good reasons no matter who Tiger Woods is. But but the ad vericundium fallacy is built around just um, taking him as an authority when he's not necessarily an authority and 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 asking people to basically buy the product on the basis of an emotional attachment. And by the way, I did see uh, 
another article where it says they've gotten back together again. <laughs> you know, now that the storm has passed, Buick has, has resigned Tiger. Um, you know, so, and why? Well, you know, people starting to feel good about the guy again, you know. Uh, so, but, but one of the things that your text points out about the Edu-Hurricanium fallacy is um, sometimes people can be knowledgeable in, in more than one area. And, and so it might not necessarily be a fallacy. Um, you wouldn't ask your normal run-of-the-mill movie actor for advice on helicopters, right? Suppose your company were thinking of purchasing one. You wouldn't go to the normal run-of-the-mill actor and say, well, give me some authoritative advice on helicopters. Why? Because they're not an authority in that area. But if you take Harrison Ford, you know, from Star Wars and um, various other Indiana Jones as movies. I mean, he is a very qualified helicopter pilot. He would be somebody who would be knowledgeable in that area as well. And another good example of the kind of thing your text talks about is uh, is if we let's suppose we did a Google search. Um, website and this is one video after another and, and I'm not necessarily going to play them but you know your normal um, comedian wouldn't be authoritative in the area of classic cars but Jay Leno has been a classic car collector for a long time and he's put millions of cents to us right and so he's got his own website where he talks about various classic cars and interviews people and stuff. So, so people can be, you know, authorities in more than one area. So if, if you were, let's suppose you wanted to uh, buy or recondition one of these types of automobiles or something, well, you know, Jay Leno would be an authoritative person possibly to ask on, um, you know, what to do about reconditioning uh, some of these classic vehicles. So, 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 so it doesn't necessarily commit an ad vericundium fallacy that somebody's out of their main area of expertise if they have expertise in more than one area. Um, you know, but, but again, um, if if they're not, then we're basically uh, asked to make an appeal on, on the basis of mostly emotional associations, and it's uh, an ad vericundium fallacy than an appeal to an unsuitable authority if we're asked to do that. Now, this is uh, the argumentum ad ignorantium. Um, basically says that uh, we ought to believe a proposition P because its denial, not P, has not yet been proved. Um, you know, and, and, and the people who use arguments like this a lot are people like defending, uh, uh, you know, unusual things like the existence of Bigfoot. And that, by the way, is a real picture of Bigfoot there. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, 
And I also have some land in Florida, if anyone's in. Um, yeah. So, in other words, if you were going to say, well, well, look, Bigfoot must exist because, hey, no one's proven conclusively that Bigfoot doesn't exist. Uh, or, or, you know, um, the Loch Ness Monster must be there because all of these years that people have tried to disprove the existence of the Loch Ness Monster, no one's been able to do it yet. So, so you see how this one's structured. Okay, maybe it is relevant to the truth of something that nobody's been able to conclusively prove that it's denial. But to ask somebody to positively embrace a proposition as true simply because its opposite has not yet been conclusively proven is not a very good argument. And that's that's how the Argumentum ad ignorantium fallacy goes. You know, the argument from ignorance. You say, well, where does ignorance come in here? Well, the idea is we are ignorant of, we do not know of a proof that not P, so P must be the case, where P stands for some proposition, right? We do not know of a proof that Bigfoot does not exist, so Bigfoot must exist. Um, yeah. <clears throat> now, no, I'm not trying to say that there might not be arguments or evidence you could present. You know, there are some people who tried to do DNA studies on, on, on hair samples that people say were left by Bigfoot. And, um, you know, if you get an argument like that, you might have a scientifically based argument that would give you some evidence uh, that a creature like that exists. But this conclude, you know, wants you to conclude, this fallacy wants you to conclude the positive proposition that Bigfoot exists from the mere fact that nobody's proven conclusively that he doesn't exist. And so it's not a very good argument. Um, well, the fallacy of hasty generalization of accident is, is one where we um, conclude a general proposition uh, or a proposition about all members of a class from, um, well, from either too few cases or usually from one, unrepre one or two unrepresentative cases. Um, so, I mean, here's my example. A and it's also called converse accident. In other words, in the fallacy of accident, re re remember we tried to apply a general principle, like we should stop for red lights, to a case where it was never meant to apply to a particular case like whether or not an ambulance, uh, you know, with a patient in and going to the hospital should run a red light, you know. Um, well, here, this goes in the opposite direction. This, this takes a sample that's really not representative. And then it draws a conclusion from a non-representative sample. Um, so, in other words, now, now the, and by the way, the, these are true premises. We know that George Bird was a heavy cigar smoker and that he lived to be 100. He really did. I mean, people, one, one of us stopped jokes. You, somebody used to say, well, you know, you smoke a lot of cigars. What your doc, what's your doctor say about that? And he said, well, my doctor's dead. You know, he's basically saying, I've outlived my doctor, you know. Uh, I mean, that was one of George Burns' jokes. 
the philosopher Bertrand Russell did live to be 98, and he he liked like a lot of them. Uh, you know, people who were in my graduate professor's generation was a heavy pipe smoker. Uh, you know, for most of his adult life. Well, so, but you would not be on good grounds to conclude then that everybody's wrong and and um, tobacco must promote long life, you know, longevity from these two unrepresentative samples. Right, um, so so you to reason George Burns smoked cigars, lived to be a hundred. Bertrand Russell smoked a pipe, lived to be ninety-eight. Therefore, tobacco must promote long life, longevity. I mean, uh, here you're trying to draw a general conclusion on the basis of a small and 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 unrepresentative sample. So just as accident implies um, well, as accident concerns applying a general principle to a case where it was never meant to apply, here, from some odd cases, you try to argue to a general conclusion that uh, really is not supported well by them. Um, before I go, go to the false cause fallacies, um, I had a couple examples of some of the ones we just went over. Uh, th this one I put on a test once. Now, a friend of mine and I were talking about that you know, that Saturn seem to be defunct now. Um, but paraphrase, so it's not a recent ad, but it, it, it was once a real ad for Saturn automobiles. Um, and it was something like this. Uh, they, they pictured a physician's office and some doctors there. Four physicians in this small medical practice have all bought Saturns in the past year. So if you want to know which car to buy, ask a doctor. You know, well, here again, uh, doctors are authoritative. They're legitimate authorities in their area of expertise. But it might be that Joe, three blocks away, you know, in his abandoned gas station and his little, you know, Joe the mechanic is a far more authoritative person to ask about whether you ought to buy a Saturn than, than uh, a physician. And so, uh, you know, so this is a case of ad vericundium, um, you know, of, of taking as suitable authorities people who aren't suitable authorities. Looks like our bulb is uh, on the skids here. Um, I, well, okay. Th this one basically... I, I don't want to look at all of this, but here's a paraphrase of this long argument by Gore above. He basically says, uh, there's no readily apparent alternative that would be easier politically than, than a cap and trade scheme. Now here again we can go uh, ad hominem as well, because Gore makes a bundle and his own company off of cap and trade. Uh, uh, so he, he would have loved to have seen a law in this country. Uh, but, but at any rate, his argument here is uh, we know of no other alternative that would be better politically. He says it is difficult to imagine a globally harmonized carbon tax or a coordinated multi lateral regulatory effort. But here I kind of gave people a, uh, a hint. I said, if we summarize this argument as follows, we know of no approach to reducing carbon emissions that would be politically easier to implement 
<clears throat> Therefore, the cap-and-trade approach is the one we should adopt. Well, no, well, what one does that sound like? We, we know of no proof that not P. We know of no proof that says it's... Yeah, it's kind of, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're ignorant of, of uh, any other scheme that's better than this, so we ought to use this. Um, so, uh, let's see, which one do I have here? Uh, you know what, I, I'm, I'm not going to look at this one because I'm, I'm not sure where I was going with that one. Um, but, but at any rate, now we, we saw that there can be legitimate reasoning from cause to effect. I, I mean, um, you, you know, it, scientists use legitimate cause and effect reasoning all the time. But we do too. I mean, <laughs> I shouldn't even bring this up. But I and two friends stopped at a, an ice cream store, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was in the afternoon. You know, got some ice cream and it was a good price. Left. Good ice cream and Later that day, all three of us came down with diarrhea. <laughs> well, the point is, it's probably pretty good causal reasoning for saying, well, we all ate that ice cream, you know, cause and effect, you know. I mean, probably not a bad piece of reasoning to connect it with something that all three of us did earlier that day. You know, even though it's, it wasn't scientific, right? I mean, you know, we weren't taking stool samples or anything. It's sending them to a lab to be analyzed. But, um, yeah, so there could be legitimate causal reasoning. But there are some types of causal reasoning that, that really don't fly at all. Um, and th this one, uh, non causa pro causa. What that means is putting something for a cause that's not the cause. Um, so it wrongly assumes that if two events happen together, that one event is the cause of the other when their occurrence together is an irrelevant coincidence. Um, you know, the assumed causal connection is just not there. Um, and we do this a lot, like when we're watching the game, right? Uh, you know, I wore this shirt every time I wore it, the Ravens won, or, you know, uh, the <laughs> they even had a commercial, you know, thanking the guy who never washed his lucky socks one time during the Ravens playoff run last year. Um, so th this idea of uh, on the basis of too little evidence claiming something as the cause that's really not the cause is, is how you commit this fallacy. And um, I wanted to look at some
when it breaks out. Yeah. Uh, this this is a, a good one. There there are several of them that Budweiser did that that kind of uh, make fun of our tendency to, as sports fans, uh, claim something is a cause that's not the cause. Okay. I thought that was going to be a, uh, a link to the video. I mean, there's no sense. I, I don't. I don't want an article about it. Um, yeah, you've probably seen this one. But but look at the causal connection that's argued for in this one. So they have their Budweiser labels out, and the guy's taking the field goal. <laughs> and note this, this guy's saying, say, are you kidding me? It actually worked, right? You know, well, you know that there's no real causal connection between getting your Budweiser label facing out and whether or not the, the field goal kicker really uh, kicked the field goal. Um, but. Yeah, so, so the, the non-causa pro-causa then um, version is uh, one where superstition occurs a lot um, and, and it links two events as cause and effect that may be just So, so you're in, you're, you're concluding a causal connection on the basis of too little evidence. Um, now, the first one that they list in your book is the post hoc ergo prompter hoc fallacy. Um, and it, it, it basically says, well, event B happened after event A, so uh, in, in other words, one way to identify this one is there's a time association involved. The, the one before it just picks something as a cause on the basis of a coincidental happenstance, you know. Uh, you know. So this one basically says after, therefore caused by. Event B happened after event A, therefore event B was caused by event A. So it concludes just because of the temporal succession of one event after another, it concludes on the basis of too little evidence that there's a causal connection involved, you know. Um, so wrong assumes that two events happen, one right after the other, that they're following one another in time, means the first event is the cause of the second. So, uh, you know, just because there's been a rise in crime since the institution of the death penalty, it would be a fallacy to attribute this rise to the death penalty as cause, you know. So sometimes, um, you know, there, there are some serious 
arguments that um, that use this or, or that commit this type of fallacy that try to make a causal connection between two events. And, and, and one, just to go back to the post hoc fallacy, um, sometimes just because two events are related, it doesn't mean that um, think I'm going to make some copies of uh, and we'll look at it next time um, because it, it was about a study that was released uh, a few months ago uh, and, and the article is an article by a physician saying look um, this, this study doesn't necessarily a good causal connection, you know. Uh, so that that was non-causal, pro-causal. But here, if you're looking for this fallacy, uh, one really key um, thing you want to look for is that one event has succeeded another in time. some 
somebody has an agenda to push. And, and, and your author is good about this. He says the oversimplified cause fallacy is usually motivated by self-serving interests. Um, I mean, this is part of, of what's going on in the whole global warming thing. Um, you know, if the temperature was rising, um, is a major cause the in infusion of a greater than normal amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, specifically as a result of human activity. Um, you know, or you know, are there are the causes more complex than that? You know, and is somebody wrong to say, well, okay, we need uh, stricter legislation, um, you know, governing vehicle emissions and all that because of uh, global warming? Um, is in other words. If you have somebody with an agenda to push, are they going to focus on one thing and say that's the major cause? And the UN, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, just said, never mind that we've had 17 years of global cooling when all of our models predicted global temperature rises. Nonetheless, we're absolutely certain, you know, 95% certain that um, that global warming is there. It's just being covered up, and uh, and, and and we still need, uh, you know, uh, significant, uh, you know, legislation internationally to curb it. Now, if you actually look at some of the people who are interviewed. I mean, you know, part of the story going on here is that, um, you know, it's at least arguable that the whole global warming thing is, is, is a, a schema to redistribute wealth from wealthier, um, you know, more industrialized nations to impoverished nations and using global warming as an excuse through the United Nations to do this. And, and, and there are people in the United Nations who have admitted as much that it's not even about climate change anymore. It's all about wealthy distribution, you know. Oh, but nonetheless, if somebody has an agenda to push, they're going to want you to conclude that it's, uh, it's one thing that might be responsible, and that's... Uh, Increased carbon emissions from the exhaust. You know, so, um, so at any rate, uh, now, now that's my take on this. I'm on the internet too.
Yeah, it's 